sounds like it is. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming to Lewis Love. Um, this is uh, sort of the 10th birthday celebration, although the birthday was a while ago. And I thought I should come and say something, but I didn't know what to say. But fortunately, Russ Fox has put together a slide deck. So I'm going to do something I don't think I've done for a very long time. The last time I did it, uh, I got a job at Google, but that's another story. I'm, I'm going to give a talk that someone else wrote. Uh, so they're his slides, but I'm responsible for any years in it. Um, he's got extensive speaker notes, but I'm going to try to work mostly from what I remember rather than what Russ wrote down. So, brief history to go, uh, I'm presenting, but the slide is really Russ's, and Russ deserves all the credit for it. Um, happy 10th birthday. Happy anniversary. Happy birthday, Katie. Um, thanks for everyone for coming. I'm just going to go through the past. I'm going to do nothing that was in the talk on how to speak well publicly. Um, <laughs> Not going to print my own content, it's probably not a good start, but I hope you'll find there's some interesting facts in all of this. Um, these slides, as I said, were prepared by Russ. I really want to thank him for all the stuff he's done because he's such a powerful force in the Go community and a force for good. has taught me a lot about programming. Um, some of you might not know that uh, he was an intern of mine back in the Bell Labs days, so we go way back. And I knew him before then, too. He was a, uh, the son of one of the people who worked at Bell Labs. Um, I also want to say that I'm probably going to use personal pronouns a lot, I or we or whatever, just how I tell stories. But when I do that, I almost never mean myself. I mean the community, I mean the GOAT team, I mean from context exactly who it is. Um, so what happened? Well, 2007 is when the story starts. The three of us, this is really the three, um, were in adjacent offices at Google, and I was bored waiting for a compilation. That's the story I remember, I think it's true. And I spun my chair around because Robert sat near me, and I said, well, why can't we do something about this? This is not good. Um, we chatted for about 10 minutes, and then we decided we really needed to do something. And I said, we probably want Kenny on this because he's good at making things happen. So I walked next door and I said, Kenny, do you want to do something else? And he said, yes, and we went over. Um, so on Friday the next day, uh, the three of us sat in conference room for hours, just talking, writing on the board, making things happen. Um, and then two days later, uh, in the thread that uh, Robert had started, I replied myself saying, I thought a couple things. Uh, first of all, we have this name, which is Go. And it comes from the first two letters of Google, but it also means Go Fast. It's also the Oriental language, the Oriental game Go, which I, I love. Uh, it's the Japanese group for five, which I don't think means anything in this context. But anyway, there are a lot of reasons. None of them actually are the reason, but it was just a good name. Uh, G came up, but there was a historic reason why G was a good choice. So go ahead. Um, two days later, so we're now a week after we first had the idea, Ken has written the parser, um, and we're starting to parse real Go programs. And this isn't exactly the way Go looks today, but it's kind of amazing that five, seven days after we started, we have a program that you would probably recognize as Go. There's only a few things that aren't quite right. There's like two colons. Semicolons aren't necessary anymore. And there's some spacing issues. But that's recognizably a Go program. And we, we converged that quickly on the basic Go Um Two weeks later, we've gone to the point where we were talking all about things for channels. Um, I did a lot of thinking around the channel stuff in the language. And we were trying at this point to avoid keywords everywhere, and so I was trying to use the channel operator, made some inventions, but anyway, we ended up in a very different place, which is probably a good choice. Um, so that was the thing. Um, then on October 16th, so we're still only, not even a month after we started, uh, Robert had written the first sketch of a, a draft specification for the language. I think it's sort of interesting to think of Go uh, in this way because most Projects don't start by writing down a formal specification of what you're going to do. And I think it's a critical part of the success of Go. It forces you to think really hard about issues, think about parsing, think about the semantics, and what you're really trying to do. Whereas just hacking something out early and seeing what happens um, doesn't give it the kind of rigor that we needed. And it turned out it was a few minutes that had an effect with a really good thing. Um, 2008, we were still not working on this full time, it's still a background process. Um, but I sent this mail out saying, uh, hey, here's, here's how to do Go to which I didn't mean that. But this is a how you start a separate process to then go the Go program. Um, 
I also have a thing, apparently, it's not a first item set, but for languages that have a keyword of their own name. But anyway, that's from my own point. Uh, the word Goatee didn't actually enter the vocabulary until July of that year. So we were using, we were using Go to start functions, at least conceptually, many months before the return of Goatee happened. Um, then, uh, a little bit later in March, uh, Go, uh, the Go language effect became something in version control. You can actually see this in history, you look at the get history all the time. Uh, and we counted on it and iterated and counted it. And a lot of work was actually, a lot of the thinking at least was done in Sydney that, that uh, early part of that year. Uh, and uh, by some time, we had some things start to work. We went on a program, it was kind of fun, and we got this weird, surprising, sorry, weird, surprising mail from Ian Taylor, who uh, we hadn't met yet, but he worked at, at Google. And he basically said, hey, I think my major language is a compiler. And uh, we were a little surprised at this. Um, but we love the fact that he had. And it's a vindication of the idea of starting from spec. When you actually have a specification, then someone else can come along and implement it. And then we have two implementations of spec, which does three-way check. You get to check the implementations against each other, and each implementation against the spec, and it all gets stronger as you do this. It was really, really great. Um, and eventually Ian said this was too much fun, so he said, can I come and work with you? And he said, here's your chair, sit down, go to work. Uh, and then shortly after that, I got some stuff to him. And so we kept pounding on it through 2008, getting closer and closer to finding packages, I.O. and NED, and HTTP, phone, they all showed up around then. Uh, and then it's now 2009. So the early part of 2009, we spent a while developing uh, teaching materials, courses, online stuff, because we got to teach other engineers at Google a while ago, partly to validate their own thinking, and also because we were trying to grow at the beginning of the community. Although we knew all along it was going to go into the public, but then having those teaching materials helped for the public world. But we still spent most of our time working on the implementation. Um, some of you might be surprised. Uh, Ian, Ian's first mail about putting generics in happened in 2009. Uh, he's still thinking about them today. You'll see his, his name come up again. But it's, it's for those who think that we were thinking about these just wrong. We're thinking about a lot, but it's not our problem. Um, so towards the end of that northern summer, uh, we started planning a lot for the open source So there's a tremendous amount of work about repo management and getting the documentation, getting web server together, and all this. But the missing piece, of course, was a gopher. Uh, and so we're going to do this mascot. We go gopher for us based on some characters she used before, and now we have a gopher. And this shirt predates the gopher. Some of you may know that's that. Uh, but it's also the inspiration for the current Go logo, as opposed to the mascot. So here I am, uh, two weeks before the release, I think not even actually, like 10 days before the release, uh, giving an internal talk which was recorded and available on YouTube, where we tug the language then. And if you watch that there, that talk, which I don't necessarily recommend, a lot of it is uh, still quite relevant, but there's also some things that are surprisingly interesting and different. But then finally, two weeks later, November 10th, 2009, 3 p.m. California time, this went live, and we had a programming language in the open source community, and it said, come and use it, come and play, let us know what think, start hacking. Um, we posted on Google Blog, using the old Google logo font that I like better than the one right now. Um, and then first, uh, what you take is a pull release came in. Pull release came in. Somebody said, "Here's a fix to your Emacs support." Um, so five hours into the release, we get an email from this guy saying there's a patch, which of course fixed something. Uh, his name is Kevin Ballard, and he started the open source contribution. Um, nothing real that didn't happen on Twitter, so you can tell what happened on Twitter. Some of these comments are okay, some of them not. It's Twitter. Uh, that also introduces by the way the Golang hashtag hit then too. The language remember is called Go, not Golang. Uh, but a lot of things are called Go, so just distinguish it with the hashtag and be a little more special. Um, here's a successful language change proposal. Just a few days after the release, somebody said, let's drop the necessity to have something after the colon and the slice, and just if nothing is there, it means the end of the, of the slice, and that was a great idea, and we took it. It's not very important, but you see it everywhere, and so we did it, implemented it, threw it out. There it is. We're still only five days after the release happened. Um, and now that that happened, a really interesting thing occurred inside of the processing. 
So we had a department called GoFault, which I'm sure all of you have used GoFault, used, at least behind the scenes, which automatically formats the code so that you don't have to worry about a tab code or a column code or a space code all taken care of. Very, very important day one decision in the language science, automatic formatting. But um, we, just, we realized something that is very important, which is you can take the tools that let us do automatic code printing and formatting and so on, and then modify the tree in the middle. And so Russ did this thing where you can specify an argument to the formatter that says minus R for rewrite, and then you write a pattern and say rewrite expressions to look like this, to look like this instead. And he used this to update the entire tree so that all of the patterns where the length of the slice was the second thing after the colon could be dropped in the empty tray. Automatic code rewriting led to a massive rewrite to the tree. And we do this kind of thing a lot. Um, and it's really important to think that it'll be the power of that automatic code rewriting and formatting and printing stuff. So it's now 2010, we've been live for almost two months, and we won the Language of the Year Award from Taiyobi, which is a little bit silly, but it made us very happy. Um, we had only grown to like 1.5, uh, 1.25% of the traffic out there, but since we started at zero, the percentage growth was large, and so we won. And that was nice. Um, we then started up Go Blog in March. Uh, you can see Andrew Duran showing up and he helped join us to promote Go and outside the world. Many of you know uh, or have seen Andrew in his talks. Um, then uh, later that year, we won a Bossy Award from InfoWorld, the best open source application development, citing a new exciting direction in programming languages, which I think is interesting because the main criticism we got was an old boring direction in programming languages then, but maybe things were still being formed back then. Uh, much more importantly for the future, after uh, thinking about this for a long time, we figured out a way that we could, at scale, let you run Go programs inside a browser window, which involved running a compiler in our production clusters. And so you could sit there, and this is still true today, I'm sure many of you use the playground. You can actually run Go program in a browser, which doesn't sound radical, because most of you are used to JavaScript and that kind of stuff. But every time you type into the Go playground, there's all this server action going on behind it, and it's fast enough and, and really powerful to be able to do this. And let us put executable, executable examples into our blogs and our tutorials and things like that, which is really cool. Um, so then we launched the online Go Tour, which capitalized on that technology so that people could learn Go in a browser, write programs, see them run, and fix them uh, interactively, which is really cool. Um, so now we're in 2011, and things are starting to happen. People are starting to use it, people are having fun, people are complaining, it's the outside world, it's what happens. But there was evidence that things were really moving in the right direction. GCC 4.6 came out and, and was the first to include support for Go, and was based on the work that Ian first mailed to us back in 2008. It's a big golden dog at the front end that he wrote, which has probably been heavily improved since then, but uh, it started with that, that process. So Go is now with GCC support language, not to mention all the M and other such things. Again, remember to wrote that spec. That's a really important thing. Now, I'll show you the rewriter that was in GoFox. Around this time, uh, Russ did this thing called GoFix, which was a super development of that idea. But now, when we sort of plug a module into your program, you could write a little pattern recognizer in Go that would recognize parts of the Go tree, and then you could rewrite them into something else, and then sort of, sort of written out in the uh, form. And this was there because we haven't yet launched Go One. So Go is still changing a lot. And we're changing things, we're improving libraries, we're tweaking the language. What this Go Fix led us to was make those changes, and then when we send out an update, every everybody could run Go Fix, and most, not all, but most of the of the fixes necessary to track the updated release could be done automatically by this tool. So it really let us move fast about breaking people to programs which was a really cool thing. And this let us rapidly convert on all the things we wanted to fix before we locked everything down with Go 1. Now in May of that year, we announced support for running Go programs on Google App Engine, which was a really fast project to put together, uh, but really cool, and in May, uh, drew us a buzz to go along with it. Um, more importantly, everyone went to Google I.O. got one of these plush covers, which is great when they designed, so there he is looking pretty calm. He was actually pretty nervous the night before he was announced, but we got over it. Uh, and I think a lot of you have seen this guy right there. 
Um, and then Christopher Renee designed the vinyl as well. This is the vinyl over. Um, this is the vinyl. And that went out uh, in Austin, in Portland, in July of that year. Um, so one of the things that everybody knows, but we knew it when we had to build on it, the best way to get people to use products is to get stuff away. So uh, we got another nice surprise later that year. Uh, some engineers at YouTube had been used to go to build a, a load master for large SQL datasets. And they were using it to do uh, analytics on, on YouTube stuff. And at the time, although it's much, much bigger now, it had been launched with about 100,000 queries per second through this Go Network uh, server set, which is a project called TESS. And that really was an enabler for us to believe that what we were doing made sense. But there are other things that were fun too. So in the US Thanksgiving, there was this thing with a turkey that a developer who never used Go before put together in 24 hours and launched in, into production so that people on Thanksgiving could make silly looking turkeys on the web, which was our doodle for the Thanksgiving day in, in the US. Um, so now we're at 2012. Things are starting to really happen now. The most important thing in 2012 for Go's history was the creation of Go version 1, because that was the version when we stopped changing stuff. We, of course, made all kinds of changes since then under the covers, but we stopped changing the language, we, we locked it in four libraries, and we said, if your program compiles today, it'll compile in perpetuity for any Go one that I And we really, really stuck to that. That's a critical part of the success of Go. Um, so Go Fix was great to get us here, but it wasn't enough to lean on for any perpetuity, so we really had to make a promise we were going to stay compatible with the future. And uh, that, I think, was a huge decision and a really important one. And then a few months later, Derek Collison uh, made the prediction that within two years, Go would become the dominant language for system work in what we now call cloud infrastructure. Um, he was right. Remember that date, September 11, 2012. Um, and then at the end of the year, uh, with all this stuff happening, it was nice to see another silly Google thing, which was the uh, Google Maps Santa Tracker for the end of the year. It was a Go program. And I don't know what all those little presents are, but somebody's happy somewhere. But that was all done again with a quick Go program running in production. So, 2013, now we're really in growth phase. Um, now, what happened here was critical to where we are today. Solomon Heiss, uh, worked at a company called Dot Cloud, and he gave a demo at PyCon, PyCon conference, showing off this new thing that was called DC, but rapidly got renamed to Docker. And in fact, the whole company got mentioned became Docker. And what it showed was containers being written, uh, and it was a Go wrapper that made it easy to launch and deploy and modify production services inside what we now call the cloud. Um, you might wonder why Go was announced. Like a goal product like Docker was announced at a Python conference. And the reason was there were no goal conferences. But that changed too, because in April 2013, the first ever Go conference happened in Tokyo. So that's the Japanese leading the way. And then um, we launched Go.1.1, go go which is now 15 months after Go. Long, long interval. And we later worked on tightening up that site, which I'll mention in a minute. Uh, the biggest change with this one was that the integers became 64 bits by default on 64 bit things, so you get a 2 billion element byte slices, which is the case in the game. But uh, the big deal about the one one was that we implemented uh, the deployed race detector, which I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have used. If you haven't used a race detector or you don't know what I'm talking about, look it up, learn about it. It's an amazing tool for finding bugs in concurrent code. It's really great. Um, and then um, there was a, another big change internally. There was a project that uh, Robert and I worked on before to do log processing inside Google, but it had its own programming language that gets you design. And we, uh, in that year, we flipped the internal processing to start using Go, which is much more efficient, much more focused, and that was a big deal. And we announced that internally as well. Uh, as far as we know, that was the first time Go started being used for big time data processing, although I'll get used for that a lot now. Um, oops, sorry. Um, and then Go 102 came out, which is the three native slices and so on, so it's pretty a litany of features called Skip Roll Up very quickly. The biggest thing that happened now was that we planned explicitly for a six month release cycle instead of those long gaps unpredictably. So that we would announce what the next set of changes would be, we 
multiply by six months and go to cycle four. That's been quite helpful. Um, there was a test coverage tool that appeared in one of two, yes, one of two, um, that does this use, using source code rewriting rather than binary instrumentation, which makes it portable and it's also another big win for automatic code formatting because that's how that it works. Okay, 2014, time is ticking. Um, there's a big service that you probably have all used without knowing, which is a data compression service for mobile networking that Go runs, the Google, Google and Go run in production uh, that serves a staggering amount of data. Pretty much everything you need to deliver to your phone to the Google network is running through this compression service set. All on Go, handling billions and billions of requests every day. Uh, so the story of Go becoming an important part of service software is always going to catch on. And now, in 2014, in March, Redmond, Danny Burkle, Burkle wrote this little blog where he called Go the emerging language of uh, infrastructure. Now that's less than two years since their calls and said in two years it will be the language of cloud infrastructure. So it's really happened. Like Go has become a new language for cloud stuff, which was not really the original vision, although it's certainly very closely aligned to it. Now, GoCon happened. In July, I think it was 2014, the first Go conference in North America finally happened in Go for Con. It was not organized by Google, it was partially sponsored by Google, but it was a community effort by a bunch of other folks put together this fantastic conference. And it was so amazing for me personally, for Russ, for Ken, Ian, and Robert, just to stand in that room and have 750 people who were all there because of something we did because we got bored waiting for a compilation. That's, that's pretty wonderful. Uh, it was an amazing conference, an amazing feeling. There's so still great conferences, and they're in Disney World next year, not Disneyland. Disneyland is in California, Disney World is in Florida. But uh, it'll be a lot of fun next year, too. Um, so we also uh, handed out new plush sofas in multiple colors. There's now two more colors for them. He somehow got cuter. I don't know how that happened, but anyway, he's, he remains cute. And by the way, even though that one on the right is pink, he's still a boy. I'm told, but uh, who knows? Uh, another big incredible piece of cloud infrastructure: Kubernetes got launched. Another Go program written this time at Google, but it is an open source project, and it's built on top of Docker now. So it's a Docker orchestration program that got a lot of stuff in, in people's cloud management software. Um, then it just keeps happening, right? The, the biggest thing that happened in 1.3, which we'll have that year, is a better garbage collector. There's a lot of other better stack handling of those sort of detail if you haven't seen, but uh, okay, the new garbage collector is coming. Um, but it was in this original garbage collector, it's faster and more precise. But going around with this, this is we're leading up to the, the work here is laying the ground so the garbage collector can be precise and fast, which is coming soon. Um, Cockroach TV was a Google spin up, effectively. Two, two really cool Googlers I actually worked with uh, started this company, Cockroach TV, which is an amazing product for doing scalable uh, NoSQL kind of databases. All ready to go. And when they were launching, they were sending all this mail. I want to say, well, you know, we're going to be going in full time. That was cool. Um, the first go from conference in Europe occurred uh, in October of 2014. Um, there's, uh, and so the world is all around the world now, these conferences. A um, couple more things happened in one of the four, you know, that we already featured. Uh, in April of 2015, we had a conference in China, so we now we made it to Asia. Now, I'd like to say that before this happened, if you went on the Google Trends page and looked up uses of Go in Google searches, China had more searches about Go than the rest of the world put together. And everybody assumed that it had to be something like Go or Go language or the word in Chinese or something. But you could tell that wasn't true because it started, all that started the day we launched. So it was clearly about the language. And then it turned out, as we learned when we started to connect with the people in China who were using it, that Go was actually huge in China. Uh, and, and that's that's really cool. So there's now really big conferences every year in uh, China about Go on by Go users. Amazon announced the AWS SDK. Uh, Heroku started initial support. Uh, Microsoft announced support uh, on Azure. So everyone's starting to sort of believe in it now, making it happen. Uh, and we're just watching it. It's great. Okay? Now, I love this picture. Um, this is from the second GoForCon in Denver again in 
mid-2015. This picture is by me, and I love it. And that's another gopher designed by Renee. What's really cool about this is she did not design this figurine. She drew a drawing for the conference, and some guys, who the conference runner, Frank Edelson and Co., worked with a company in Japan without telling anybody, and they built a, a figurine of this guy. What's really amazing, and we're so happy, is that this figurine perfectly captures that drawing. Which is an amazing thing. Take someone else's art and turn it into a different medium and have it cast it for it's, it's a wonderful guy. Um, he's supposed to have straws coming out of his mouth and rain, so that was just too hard. But he's, he's so cute. Um, so we introduced it at GoForCon a bunch of stuff around that proposal, getting the community more involved, making sure that the, pro the process for making things happen with the community was properly documented. Um, Later that summer, Go Ridge and Wounded Go were founded, which are two of these important organizations bringing uh, the Go message to communities of programming maybe a little outside of the normal, which is great. And they do do that because they're going to be going to Sydney now, which is very successful. Um, we're up to have hundreds and hundreds of developers that are bringing along, so this is great. Um, now, 1.5, which came out in 2015, is one of the biggest Go releases ever. Because it's the one when all the C code went away. And Go became totally what they call self hosted. The compiler was going to go, the assembler was going to go, the leaker was going to go, everything was going to go. It was a bit of a magic push to get there, and it wasn't the cleanest it could have been, but it's all been tied up, it's actually quite strong now. But the other big piece that happened was now that it was in Go, it was a lot easier for people to work on it rather than in C, because it had all the features of Go at your disposal. So at this point, with help from Rick Hudson and Austin Clement, a new guard collector winning, which had fantastic performance characteristics. Um, this is probably my second favorite slide in this talk. You can see the, this is the garbage collection pause time of a, who is it? It's somebody at an engineer called Fabric, an engineer company called Fabric. And the, 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 the noisy bar at the top is all their servers and the garbage collection time. And then you can see they deployed the canary for the new garbage collector. And the garbage collection time went down to that much. And then when they get all the rest of them, they're all down there. So it went down from 300 milliseconds to 20 milliseconds in one release. It's an amazing work by those guys. The typical times now are much, much better than that. We're down to the microsecond level now. It's, it's amazing how the garbage collection is going. So we're at 2016. Uh, we've got HTTP2 in. we got uh, uh, the nice thing about HTTP2 release was GoCo didn't have to change at all, it got a better protocol. And it is a much better protocol, much better at multiple connections in particular. Um, the GoTime podcast started with its first uh, podcast then, and it's a really good podcast if you don't know about it, and you should. There's a lot of good, interesting stuff that they did it roughly weekly, and the change in cast characters, and get outside to come in and talk about things. Really good one. Um, there was a, a discussion now in the Go team about the problem of package management, what you might, might think is dependency management and things like that, which Go was never good at because we hadn't faced that thing in Google. Google does it a certain way that doesn't really work in the outside world. Um, but the discussion, uh, the team started really engaged the community on this problem. And so at GoForCon in 2016, there was a big discussion about management of packages, what to do about vendoring. And everyone agreed there was too much, a big mess. So they started a team to think about the problem and understand space better. Um, uh, this is an a compiler thing. Um, now we're in Brazil, uh, South America, and other continents. I think at this point, the only continent that has a double net go on is Antarctica, but I don't know. Maybe there is one there. Uh, 2017. Uh, the, this was a product that came out of that sort of working group to play with the tennis management. They created a cool called DEP and launched it for public trials. And it was pretty interesting, but it had some issues, which have been talked about a lot. But now 1.8, the uh, compiler has gotten so good, we're doing non x86 uh, backends of very high quality. And the typical garbage collector pause now is in the microseconds, often in just a, you know, like 10 microseconds, even for gigabyte each. Uh, it's pretty amazing, actually. Um, now, in the summer, go for non northern summer. Sorry, I'm still getting used to that. Uh, at GoForCon that year, there was a contributor workshop. Which was the first one where they really sat in a room together and everybody talked about problems, working on things together. 
And this was the conference where they first announced what we think of as the go-to process. A process that after some years of post stability in the language, from the uh, user point of view, we wanted to see what really needs to change. We've been using it for years, what's wrong, what you fix. And so that process started. There has been a fair bit of change, but there's probably a lot more to come. There's a lot of people in this city, my very nice, Russ is there, Ian is there, um, Carmen is here. Uh, a few months or so ago, and then Anyway, that's just a big room full of hackers. Um, type aliases in 1009, now up to 2018. Now, this, this 2018 uh, started with 1.10 aliases, which is a really big deal because it changed the way builds work so that they're automatically cached and managed. And this is a critical part of the set for understanding package management and deployment, and it was a critical set towards making sure that what you build is what you expect to build. Because we're now doing cryptographic hashes to build artifacts and making sure that uh, things are properly understood, ready to be constructed. And having a version where cache makes it possible to test much faster than if many of you have seen with the test since then. Um, and once that was out, Russ really started to focus on package versioning in a big way. He wrote a long series of very thoughtful Posts about how package version works and should work. And for those of you who are interested in the problem, it's actually way harder than people think. But there's been a lot of thinking about it, and the rest of the blog posts are actually really good place to learn about the problems and why, in particular, DEP didn't solve the problem quite right, and why the Go module stuff is different. And so that is the proposal for Go module, which came out later that year, which is only a little over a year ago now. But the, uh, after some big discussion, it was decided to accept that proposal. And in 1.11, which came out later that year, uh, the pro proposal was accepted and the preliminary implementation launched in here. Um, and now this is what WebAssembly launched. So you can now follow the WebAssembly. It's still experimental, but it's quite useful, I understand, and working well. Um, but the, maybe the best thing about this release is this is the first one when more people from outside Google contributed to the project than people inside Google. So we cross over to you know community singularity at this point. Uh, and then we started the, the, the go-to process in earnest with drafts of three proposals to make modest changes to the language that will be sort of canaries for the bigger changes that are coming. Um, they involve error handling syntax, error values, and a trial of generics. This all continued through the fall into the next year, and then some were scaled back. Generics are still underway. But while all this is happening, we got another surprise, um, which was the guy who did an original test at Load Balancer for, no for SQL pardon me, at YouTube had now started a company. And uh, Planet Scale is a company that's basically taking that test code and using it uh, as a product on a massive. Uh, uh, SQL database. So if, if you have that problem, these are your guys to talk to. And again, it's all based on that code from long ago, one of the first test cases. For it. So now we're issue. 2019, Renee uh, knew that the 10th anniversary was coming, so she drew this control room for us. There's a lot of Easter eggs in this drawing. You can explore it a little later. Um, but I hope you can tell these guys are working hard to make sure those gophers in space do well. Um, Go 112 came out at TLS 13. Modules got a lot better. Um, we also announced mostly community stuff this year. The Go Development Network happened. Uh, we're part of the Go Development Network here. It's a way to make meetup meet organizers into a cohesive unit, sharing content, sharing projects, and, and trying to bring things together. There's 150 meetup groups with 90,000 members worldwide. And that's still a small fraction of the go for community globally, which is in the millions. But those are the passionate ones who make, make things happen. Uh, module support went into the playground, which doesn't sound like a huge thing, but now you can try any module-based import here. So you can use your playground to run stuff that's uh, not just a core library, which makes it a lot more powerful as a tool. Um, and then in July this year, GopherCon, Ian talked more about generics. It's not the only thing he does, but he thinks about it a lot. He does a lot of things. Uh, and we're now, I get the feeling they're close to thinking this is the way it's going to work. So I'll let you look at Ian's talk a little more. But it's definitely not a promise it's going in, or a promise it's not. Um, but the thinking is starting, it's been a decade, right? Remember that first email back in 2009, I think it 
was. He's been thinking about it for 10 years, and we're finally getting to the point where we understand how to make not only generics, but generics that belong to go maybe all on go. So we'll see. That's the name of Maybe one of the no problems. I Who knows? Maybe not. Uh, another couple of significant pieces. Now that we have the Go module stuff working well, two critical tools arrive as services. One is the uh, checksum database to make sure that when you fetch something, you get what you fetch, what you want. And another is the, uh, the proxy, which is uh, a mirror, a mirror basically of Go modules, so that you don't have to necessarily always go to the same service. You build a network of proxies that are cryptographic and signing the modules and making it much faster. It makes a big difference in Sydney when you're doing. Uh, that one gets set a lot faster now. And you can run a module proxy yourself if you want to run it here to your, your own uh, enterprise. Uh, one of 13 has the module turned on by default. It also has the module mirror turned on. And the checksum of the database is there. So it's not by default. But if you have modules on, you get the, the checksum database and the module mirror. So performance is much better. And you're now getting a much nicer experience with, with package management. There's a bunch of other changes that went in. Uh, version of the error wrapping stuff went in, uh, modules got better. Number of those changes for the very interesting, but a lot of people really like the fact that you can now have you know, base two number of those, which is fun. I used it right away. It was kind of I did not want it, but I did. So that was cool. Uh, and then last one, Sunday, November 10th, 2019, go turn 10 years old. And so that was a celebration opportunity that we're sending into December because we're part of people. And uh, we get a cake, and Go has now turned 10 years old from the open source release, so happy birthday to Go. Now, of course, it goes back 12 years, but we measure it from the open source release, which is in November 2009. So, I'm just going to conclude by saying happy birthday to Go. Thanks to all of you for helping make Go what it is, for making me very happy that we decided to do what we did. And there's two hands up at the back waving that are telling me. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. 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 Uh, you, did you have this art? No, you had the older art, right? Yeah, the older art. This is the 10th anniversary art. I think you had the 5th anniversary art, which is also pretty cool. Go for the Golden Roll Anyway, anyway I, I know that I didn't do anything that Chris said I should do in my presentation. I didn't tell you a story. I didn't uh, have a villain. There's no villains here. Uh, maybe a generic for a villain, I don't know. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I didn't have a 3X structure, it was just a litany. But I hope you agree with me that the last 10 years of Go have been full of events, really exciting, amazing development when I think back on where we started, and who knows what the next 10 years will bring. So I hope to share that with all of you in another 10 years. Thank you very much. Do you want, do you want to do the Q&A or just... Do you want to do Q&A or just want to cut the quiz? Maybe a couple of questions and then we'll do the quiz. Mm -hmm. uh, can you please uh, you could, uh, talk about uh, uh, yeah. that? That is good. Uh, yeah, if you could talk on uh, translating process uh, specifications and shape specifications in an online way to introduce uh, new Oh, the, the PDF. Yeah. Yeah. Scanning the PDFs and yeah. the instructions yeah. that was done. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is that? Is that it's, it's, it it never finished. It actually kind of ran, but it never completely got done. Yeah. A lot of things happened, but it did. It, it is perfectly feasible, and most of it is done. But I, yeah, you're right. We should really finish that off because it's pretty cool. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, I gave a talk at GoFar, I think it was, um, where using the work that Russ did and the new assembler that I've done. Um, we were generating instruction set tables for the assembler automatically. So the Go assembler doesn't care what your machine is. It just reads some tables. And we could scan, literally scan the PDFs, generate the tables, and have an assembler. It's very overstating it. 
We never quite got exactly that far, but I was promised on the that project would be done and never quite finished. So, yes. Uh, any other questions? One more, maybe? Yes, Chris. So, if you go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice at the very first day, one piece of advice at the very beginning. Um, I think it would have really, would have helped me emotionally to know that mostly it was going to be hate at the beginning, and the love would come later. <laughs> and because it was, it was a little bit of love going on, there was an awful lot of hatred, and it died down over time. We still get it, but there's, there's so much more successful stuff that it, it took me a while to, you know, to feel that, that it was going to succeed, and so it was kind of rough for a while. But, but. Um, I guess the, 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 a better answer is that we didn't really understand how to manage and engage the community well at the beginning, and it would have helped a lot had we done a better job of that from the beginning. And there's been a lot of work in the last few years to try to lift our game there. And I hope some of you can feel the difference because I think it is working really well. So understanding, we never had anything to succeed like this before, any of us, and so not being able to handle the way the community would respond and how to handle the flood of information and, and proposals and comments and so on and make everyone feel involved. It's really a hard problem and we're still learning tremendously. But it's a problem we learned how to share with the whole community and that's really good. That's a very good question. All right, let's stop there because there's a quiz coming. Thanks everyone.